أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to another Ilm Feed podcast episode. I'm your host, Fatima Barakatullah, and I've got a guest all the way from America today with me. Uh, she is the founder of an organization, Rabata, an organization dedicated to promoting positive cultural change through creative e- educational experiences. She recently completed her doctorate in leadership and she has a master's in curriculum theory and instruction. She spent 20 years in Syria uh, studying the traditional and classical Islamic sciences and I'm pleased to have her here today. It's Sheikha Tamara Gray. Assalamu alaikum Sheikha. Wa alaikum salam. I'm, I'm the one who's happy to be here. I love the UK. Do you? Yes, well, I do. That's great because I was actually going to start by asking you, how do you, because, you know, it's nice sometimes to, to get the view of somebody from the outside. Mm-hmm. How do you, how does the uh, UK feel to you? And when you come to London, what, what, how do you feel about us Londoners? What do you notice about us? Well, I, don't, I mean, I really love the UK. I love London. I love the feeling in the streets. I'm very much a city person. So I lived in Damascus for 20 years. Very busy city. People, you know, just teeming with people. Yeah. And London reminds me of Damascus. You know, subhanAllah, I used to say all the time that London has more hijabi women than Amman. Not than Damascus, but than Amman. And so there is this sense, I think, for me, when I get off the plane and I start whatever I happen to be doing that at that particular period of time in the UK, this sense of really entering into a country where there are a lot more visible Muslim women. Uh, the United States is a large country, so you don't see all the Muslim... Uh, there, we don't have the concentrations, I think that's really what it is. Even in sh- places like Chicago and New York, London is really... London's where it's at. <laughs> if you are a Muslim <laughs> woman and you want to just really feel part of the part of the ethos of the city and just feel like this is normal to be a Muslim woman mm-hmm. here in London. So I, I really, I love it for that, but I also love the real English. I love tea and I love <laughs> English. Uh, Scones. Engli- and yeah, cream tea. Yeah. <laughs> I love, there's a little town on the border of Wales and, and the oh. UK called Hay on Wai that's a book town. I adore it. So I have a lot of sort of personal things that I like about the UK as well. You, you don't have a personal connection with the UK in terms I of do. family or... I I do. I do actually went. So you mentioned that I lived for Syria in 20 years. I left Syria in 2012, one year after the war started. And when I left, I left with my, my husband and my son and my daughters had already left. And at that point in our lives, my husband didn't have a job. I didn't have a job. It was quite, and you can imagine it was, we were leaving because of the war. And actually I was, in my head, I thought I was taking a five-month break from the war. I thought, oh, it's going to be... I was very naive. And so my husband and I decided that I would go back to my family in Minnesota, where I'm originally from. I had been away from them for so long. It just made sense. And we would sort of figure things out from there as he looked for a job. He did... He At that moment, he had found a two-month appointment as a postdoctorate fellow at St. Andrews University. When you're the mother of a teenager you know you can't put your high schooler in school for two months. It's just not healthy. So we made this mutual decision that I would go back and put him in high school near my family. That would be stable. And then the only change we would make is if we could get back to Syria. Obviously, that part didn't happen. So what happened is after his two-month appointment, they really liked him. They appointed him. But then that was only for a year. So then again, we said, oh, can we uproot my high school age son? You know, we're always thinking mm. about our children. Yeah. And so basically, year after year, uh, that's been what's been happening. And so he com- he graduated from high school. He just graduated from the university, alhamdulillah. And so my husband, we've had a very long-distance relationship. He's here in the U.K. I'm in Minnesota. So I come back and forth a lot. So maybe that's why I like the U.K. so much, because I get to visit my husband here. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Mashallah. So... I mean, it's really interesting that you said you were in Syria um, at that time, at that crucial time. SubhanAllah, like, I can't even imagine what it must have been like. Can you give us some sort of idea of what it was like to go from, I guess, normality 
like what was normal life like and then how did things slowly change oh you mean during the period there. of the yeah. war just I as mean, a person <clears throat> living there well I, I don't know i mean it was i my life in damascus i was in damascus and damascus is the capital so throughout it has been very protected and it is has remained much more protected than any other part of the of the country mm. and so i don't think i experienced the same kinds of things that someone from another city could really share mm. i certainly there were some scary moments and all of this but really ultimately i don't have the kinds those kinds of stories my life stayed really quite normal until i left i was working full time at a school i loved the school i was um at a great job you know what what changed for me was the move so when i moved and all of a sudden even in America, going to the grocery store became overwhelming. American grocery stores are enormous. And in Syria, I had my meat guy and my vegetable guy and my juice guy, you know. And, yeah. um, <clears throat> excuse me. It was, it was my country. I was going back to my country, the United States. But it had changed in 20 years. And, of course, of course. I had grown and changed. And so that was the... That was really hard. And being away from Syria, I think, was almost harder for me than when I was in Syria. Because now I was subject to watching everything unfold on television in, on television or wherever mm -hmm. instead of in real life, which it was there was some sort of um, ease in actually being there where you could sort of sort through what was reality and what wasn't. But alhamdulillah, Allah's plan is the best of plans. And... Uh, so I saw, um, uh, Sheikha Tamara, that you had your hand on a mouse <laughs> on your Facebook page, ready to click the send uh, button. And that was, I believe, you sending your thesis yes. off. So, you know, congratulations, <laughs> Thank mashallah, you. about that. Uh, how did that feel, you oh. know, getting to the end of that process? Oh, <laughs> It felt many different, I had so many different emotions. On one hand, I felt the feeling of euphoria and accomplishment. On the other hand, I had this feeling of exhaustion. And I think there's a letdown. I think um, there's this place where you keep your adrenaline going because you know you have to finish. <laughs> yeah. And so when you push that button, you sort of say, um, now what? Wait, now what? what's yeah. next? But it was it was really mostly the positive feelings. And I really learned myself from the process of writing that dissertation. Mm -hmm. I learned about myself. Mm -hmm. And so one of the feelings I had in pushing the button is, okay, I'm ready for, for the next stage of my life. I'm ready now to take on my life's work and really focus on that and uh, make it happen. Inshallah. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can you tell us a bit about your thesis? Like your, you did uh, a doctorate in leadership. Mm -hmm. So, can you so tell us that was a department that I was in at the University mm. of St. Thomas. And the, the, the thesis was, a dissert I looked at Muslim women's religious leadership in digital religion. And so I did, it was a qualitative research, meaning that I was really looking at the phenomena, the phenomenology, what is happening here with Muslim women and leadership today. What are their, what's their narrative? What's their life experience? And so I dug deeply into the lives and writings and online presence of seven different women who are wow. in digital religion today. And I also looked at uh, a thread of 70 Muslim women who were talking to one another about their lives. And so I, I, that was more of a sort of a triangulation of the data. So I'm looking at the seven women. Do these other, does it kind of sound like it's similar with the 70 women as well, mm -hmm. which it did. And I, in looking at that, I really, I, my theories that were in my mind, I was thinking about things like chaos theory and the concept of digital religion. What is that today? And as Muslim women, how do we need to be, I shouldn't say the word need, but how are we? embracing it or not embracing it how are we interacting with it and then as a researcher what does that look like in the big picture and then on a very personal level i noted the very the real difference of where we are compared to like evangelical christian women who are doing a really good job of embracing digital religion and using it for their personal goals and i'm 
on a very personal level then, again, this isn't about my research, but my own personal learning Mm -hmm. was that we need to do better. We need to, I believe, you know, this is my personal opinion that we need to do better and we need to recognize the reality of digital religion and then take it on and, and use the tools in ways that are going to really help us to achieve our goals of, for myself, positive cultural change, uplifting the Muslim ummah and really helping us towards our positive life changes. So when you say digital religion, do you mean the, I'm just thinking from my understanding, do you mean uh, using the online space uh, or using the current technology? So what I learned in my research is Mm. that digital religion is really what we have today. The definition of digital religion, the sort of formal academic definition is that is Well, let me back up from a formal definition first. When we're talking about religion, we're talking about an experience of people with faith and practice. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that includes ritual and belief and knowledge and community and leadership. Now, the reality is that the world has become a digital space. And so the question then is, is religion also part of that digital space? And those who research digital religion, that's not me. I was looking at it as something that someone else had researched as a Muslim woman's religious leadership within it. Those who research digital religion are saying that all religion today is in a digital space, even if the actual teachers or the that congregation, whatever the religion is not, because your congregants are online. Right. And so we we need to begin looking at, or I propose that we begin to understand that places like Facebook and Twitter and podcasts and such things are neighborhoods. If we Mm. think about them as neighborhoods, new neighborhoods where the online is real. And we have to, even in the nineties research was telling us that online experiences affect us physically. And so that means they're real. It's not a virtual reality. It's Mm. a reality Mm -hmm. for us. Yeah. And I believe that especially religious Muslim women have pushed back against that. I I hear a lot of rhetoric around, oh, no, online, it's just not as effective. Oh, no, I can't teach online. But the reality is, if we're not going to be teaching online, if we're not going to realize the reality of online learning is truly affecting people, we're Mm. losing out. We're losing out on on an experience of our students. They're all online. (laughs) Very few of them are not online. And so they're experiencing that as well. So either we are part of their neighborhoods or we're not. And so, I don't know, maybe that's... Uh... Yeah, yeah, I guess I guess it's basically that, you know, if you're not online, uh, then you're, you're not reaching the people who you want to reach in terms of influencing and... That's true. But yeah. also, if you're not online, don't think you're not online. That's the other point I'm making here. So one of the women that I wanted to include in my study, but I wasn't able to reach her... She is so not online that she doesn't even have an email address. And that's on purpose. She does not want to be part of the online world. But her students are online. And so they're (laughs) quoting her online. Her teachings are online. Therefore, she is online in one way or another. (laughs) Whether she likes it or not. Whether she likes it or not. That's my point that digital religion, we are part of the digital world. It's no, Mm. we can't really separate it. We can't say, oh, over there is digital world, and over here is non-digital world. Mm. Even if you are on an island somewhere, someone is talking about you on that island on Twitter. And so you are connected. We are mm. one world. And so once we recognize that, now my research was all about, well, what does Muslim women's religious leadership look like in that space? Right. And one of my findings is that we are not really taking control of it that others have control of our message. And Mm. it's really important that we take control of our message, that we know the message we are delivering. Yeah. And we are able to have control of it in one way or another. You know, I completely understand that because um, I remember a few years ago when I used to be invited quite a lot onto the BBC and different channels, you know, to discuss. And it was always something that they wanted me to discuss, right? So things like the veil and... You know, topics that, frankly, were not big things in my mind, you know. Yes. I had other things that I wanted to talk to them about. But because they were setting the agenda, mm-hmm. uh, I would be invited. And 
of course, they would edit it and they would present it the way they wanted to present it. And I think one of the reasons why I actually did decide to go online and have my own pages and my own is in a way to take back that power, you know, to take back that. Absolutely. The narrative and mm -hmm. to be able to say no, um, you know, if somebody had framed something that I said in the incorrect way, for example, to be able to clarify, you know, and to to put the um, uh, what I really meant forward. Not only that, messaging is long term. Mm. And so when we control our own channels, yeah. we get to decide what goes on our channel. Yeah. When when other people are recording us and putting our talk on their channels, they're they're deciding what that message is. And that doesn't mean, by the way, the message is bad. It could mm -hmm. you could be contributing to a very positive message yeah. that they are teaching, but it's still not yours. Right. But I guess um for a lot of Muslim women, one of the factors is also and I must say it's not easy. It's like something you have to get used to. Um being able to being willing to be that visible public space. you know and Absolutely. be that uh, and and i think um i mean i do respect you know sisters who they have their reasons you know that maybe it's because of privacy because of family reasons maybe their family doesn't like that kind of exposure or they personally don't you know so i guess even the sisters who aren't in that public space um i mean don't choose to be um they're still being able to influence, you know? Um, like, what I'm trying to get at is that sometimes I feel that uh, when we have conversations amongst sisters, especially sisters who are scholars or, you know, teachers, um, we often kind of compare ourselves to the to the male speakers, right? Mm -hmm. So we will say things like, uh, how come, you know, the, the most famous speakers are men or how come this or that? And, and I think sometimes... Uh, we do a disservice to our own uh, sex, you know, because I think I see thousands of sisters, they might not want to be very public, you know, but it doesn't mean they're having no impact. Absolutely. Uh, they're having a huge impact sometimes, sometimes even a more significant impact because it's so local and so real, you know, rather than... Absolutely. I mean... So moving away from my research, because my mm. research was all about digital religion yeah. and the particular possibilities of impact in yeah. digital religion. Mm -hmm. Moving away from that, real impact real impact has to do with light, has to do with connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has mm. to do with your grounding in not only ilm, but tarbiyah, and how much have we been abroad ourselves, really? How much are right. we in control of our own nafs, aware of our own shaitan? aware of the influences around us that may pull us one way or the other that is not positive. So 100% in the world of Dawah, yeah. uh, certainly the effect that one person can have is much more connected to their connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than it is to any any particular tool, whether mm -hmm. it's an online tool, a digital tool, or a a an old-fashioned you know blackboard or old-fashioned tools. I don't really believe it's connected to tools. I really think it's connected much more to our own personal uh, connection mm -hmm. to our own faith and who mm -hmm. we are. And that's a point that I think for the du'a to the women who are working, we always have to go back and reconnect ourselves because it's really easy to be drawn along this path of I'm the teacher, right? <laughs> As opposed yeah. to I'm also, I remain a student. I remain a struggler on their own. Oh, yeah. SubhanAllah. So... Yeah, so I, you know, I'm just reflecting on sisters that I know who nobody has heard of, like people have heard of in their communities, mm -hmm. but they're not. Not in the global realm. No, and probably they're not even talked about in online and stuff, you know. But sometimes I think, wow, you know, the impact they're making because of their patient, diligent, local work, and I would say difficult <laughs> local Absolutely. work, right, mm -hmm. um, that doesn't always get recognition but that's okay because they've chosen that. They they want, they're doing it for a lot. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah. Oh, I don't want to be misunderstood to say that yeah. I think everyone needs to be in, in the public eye. Yeah. I do think we all need to recognize the import of digital religion in the digital mm. world. We need mm -hmm. to understand how it's affecting even our students and what their interaction is with it. And the more we understand that, 
even if we are choosing to be very private and very much away from it, we will be more effective having an understanding of it with our students. Yeah, sure. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you also about your childhood and like, I've never been to America. <laughs> Inshallah, you'll come. Inshallah, <laughs> inshallah, I intend to, you know. Um, I know, I mean, everything I know about America is from books, uh, movies TV, yes, movies, well, and yeah. TV that I might have watched, uh, you know, as a young person, etc. Um, and the news, <laughs> oh. I guess. <laughs> Not the greatest place. Uh, yeah. But, you know, uh, I want you to tell me, like, what was it like? Growing up in, tell us about the part of America you grew up you grew up in because I'm aware that all of America is not like the same. Right, America is huge. Yeah. I grew up in in a suburb of a of St. Paul, which is the capital of a state called Minnesota, which is right at the north on the border of Canada, fairly close to Chicago. That's sort of a central point people know about. Mm-hmm. Minnesota is known to be very cold. Lots of snow in the winter, and that's a that's a stereotype that hold that used to hold true when I was young. With climate change, there are some differences in that. But for example, when I was young, the drifts would get t- much taller than me, and my brother and I would dig tunnels through the snow and little houses in the snow, and and really play outside for hours in the snow. I had a very sort of typical suburban childhood where I went to public school. And I was a Christian. I was raised in the Christian church. My parents were divorced when I was something around sixth grade or something. My mother was a was part of the feminist movement, and that was that had a really big influence on me. I was a member of the church by myself, as in my mother went to church, but I was very much committed on my own. Uh, it was a Lutheran Protestant church. My father was Catholic. I did go to Catholic church a couple of times in my life, but I wasn't part of the Catholic Church. I was baptized Lutheran. I was raised in the Lutheran Church and became quite a bit of an evangelical in my high school years. I I participated in a number of different activities with the evangelicals, including summer camp and things like that. In the summer of... Oh, you haven't asked this question. You just asked about my childhood. But I was, and Amer- you asked about America, so let me... Amer- and the part of America that I grew up in was very sort of typical, I suppose... I don't know. I don't know if we fit the stereotypes because I don't know what they are. But um, it was definitely white suburban America. You know, I didn't have Mm -hmm. there. I had two black friends in high school and those are the only black kids in high school in my grade. So, I mean, it was very much a white community that I grew up in. I didn't know people from other countries. I didn't know immigrant people Mm -hmm. Uh, that when I went to the university, when I went to university, I chose the university that I applied to partially because of its very liberal and global reach. It had a lot of international students, and I was really interested in the rest of the world. I was hoping to travel and meet different people. I really wanted to sort of get out of this suburban life that I that I lived. So, Did you want to preach? Is that the reason why you wanted to? I did preach in high school. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'd, mm, that's a good question. Did I want to get out so I could? No, because the summer before I went to university, I had what I called a crisis of faith and the influence of feminism in my life by that time had made me feel that the worship of a man, Jesus, or God the Father, because again, that's a very masculine representation Mm -hmm. of divinity, was, I just just didn't want to do it. I I wasn't interested in worshiping, why am I worshiping a man? I couldn't, like, I just couldn't swallow that idea. So no, I was, I was in fact not, I didn't, I wasn't interested in preaching and I was in a real space of crisis internally because I really worried about my afterlife since I wasn't really believing in the malehood of God or of Jesus as God. SubhanAllah, that's really um, a thought provoking thing. I mean, uh, so, so you're there, you're, your mom is a feminist, so you're obviously you care a lot about you know women's rights and you care about uh, fairness and justice, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, at the same time you're being told to worship a male, right? Uh, can I ask you uh, what is the distinction between L- Lutheran? Did you say and Lutheran? Lutheran and Catholic. Uh, so the just... the Lutheran Church is one of the many Protestant churches. It's the one that was started by Martin Luther. Uh, 
Protestantism is different than Catholicism in a number of ways. Probably most significantly, the Pope the is Pope. not a leader of the Protestant Church. Mm. Uh, Protestants are very are much simpler in their theology. There are not a lot of saints. Uh, it's a little bit looser in how it talks about theological principles, and also a little bit looser, I think, as far as how it uh, talks about rules and things as well, though the evangelical Lutherans would be different than that. So there are lots of different groupings in Protestantism. So I know that like when Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel, you know, he painted God as a man, right? An old man with a long beard and uh, flowing robes, right? But do Christians actually consider God to be male? Because I thought that that was just a representation of... Part one of the results of the feminist movement is that Christian women of faith began to really examine this and write right. about is God male or is that just metaphorical? Right. And so there are a number of different writers who sort of shook the church, especially the Catholic church, a bit about that, of not being Catholic. And I'm not at all a specialist in Christian theology. So let me just begin with that. Mm-hmm. My own research in the area showed me that these different women really challenged the church and challenged this concept. Now, if you're talking about lay people, sort of the regular person, I don't think that there's a common understanding that people would say, yes, God is male. But the second you say Jesus is the son of God, mm. that's male because it's, yeah. a, it's a personification of God mm. and it's a male personification. And in mm-hmm. church, you pray to Jesus. You actually pray to Jesus. So that's male. That you can't get beyond. Now, there are plenty of Christians that go to Christian church and will say, well, Jesus is the son of God like we're all children of God, which is a completely different, very personal interpretation that doesn't really mm-hmm. fit with traditional Christian theology. Right. Okay, so you're going through this turmoil, um, you know, you're at a pivotal point in your life, I guess, as a teenager? I was 17, yeah. Right, well, uh, what happens next? <laughs> <laughs> well, I that whole summer, I was a camp counselor. I remained doing my thing, which is sort of evangelical work. But I made a promise to myself that I would talk about God only, and I would only say God, not Jesus which I was happy with in the beginning of the summer. But by the end of the summer, I was really nervous about my, like I said, my own akhira, really. Right. Wow. So I, I remember actually that summer at that camp praying a lot about this, like to God, guide me, because I really believed in God. I, that was real. It was real. But I was struggling with the Jesus part. I was struggling with the male part. So when I went to university, I was already accepted at university. I was ready to go. And I, when I was choosing my classes, I decided I was kind of an academic type. And I thought, well, you know, I'm going to fix this by taking a class, something in Christianity. And I knew that in academia, there was a lot of criticism about religion. And so I wanted to be careful to take a class with someone who was a practitioner. And so I did all that homework. And I found someone who was a practicing Christian giving a class on the history of the Old Testament. And I thought, you know what, this, this might fix me. I, um, <laughs> I don't know much about the Old Testament. I knew a lot about the New Testament. And if I learn this, maybe I'll, maybe I'll be fixed. And my goal was to be fixed. That was my goal. So I took the class. It was 8 o'clock in the morning. I'll never, that was, it was like starting, you know, you're starting off at New University, 8 in the morning, your first class, however many days a week that was. I was very serious. I was a serious student. And I went to that class with the intention of getting better. Three weeks later, I could no longer be Christian. Wow. Yeah. So the learning process had not brought me to the place I wanted it to take me. It had taken me further away. And the reason for that is a lot. But the two major points of change were, first of all, the stories of the prophets in the Old Testament were really shocking to me. They were not set up as examples to humanity. The yeah. kinds of sins and things that they had right. committed were shocking. And also, and most importantly, I learned that the time that the Trinity 
in other words, the worship of Jesus as the Son of God, became part of church doctrine was because of the Council of Nicaea. I don't exactly remember the year, but something around 365. And what that was, it was a whole bunch, basically, in, in sum, a bunch of men who got together to talk about, will we be a Unitarian church or a Trinitarian church? Mm -hmm. And in the end, they couldn't agree, so they voted. So in my 17-year-old mind, I could imagine a bunch of men sitting around a table voting on what I'm going to believe. I was like, what is that? No, no, thank you. And so I really decided I'm not Christian anymore. And uh, that was that was a really sort of strange and difficult time for me because I did still mm -hmm. believe in God. It, I wasn't denying God. I just did not believe that Christianity was the path to God at that moment. And was your, uh, I guess, uh, change in faith, was it presenting itself did your parents notice? Was I was living on campus. So in the United okay. States, very often we, we move out and we live on campus. And I was living on campus. So they did not have any idea. Right. Yeah. And you didn't confide in them or want to? No. No. It was a very personal sort of journey. Yeah. So what was the process from that, I guess, confused, would you say, or uh, doubtful? person uh that you were at that point what was the process that got you from that to islam so it seems like such a big such a big jump, jump. well I, I wouldn't describe myself as, doubt, as doubtful because okay, yeah. i've been cursed and blessed both <laughs> from very early age with always too much confidence i always have way more confidence than i should have in all things including at 17 years old when i decided i decided i'm leaving christianity I believed very confidently that God exists, and I believed very confidently that there was a religion out there, that he wouldn't create us and leave us alone, that there was a religion out there. I just needed to find it. And enough study means I'll find it. So that was my very overconfident attitude. And uh, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah for that. You know, sometimes yeah. too much confidence is... Uh, it doesn't work. But in that case, it worked. It was a blessing for me. But in a way, that it was confidence in God because... yes. It's knowing that Correct. he created me. Correct. He's not going to leave me astray. You know, he wouldn't have left human beings astray. So that's, that's great. That was a gift. It <laughs> was. You're right. Yeah. It was. That's what it was. Yeah. You're right. And so I embarked on what I called my search. And I started reading and studying all these different religions. I thought I'm going to leave no religion unstudied, except for one, which I was certain was not worth <laughs> reading. Which, of course, I'm sure you've guessed is Islam. <laughs> really? Wow. Yeah. What do I want to read about Islam for? That's the religion where all, they, they cover women in blankets and put them in closets. That's what I used to say. So I did study, and I actually almost became a Buddhist. I was very enthralled with Buddhism. I read a book called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. It's actually a wonderful book. <laughs> and I thought, oh, this is a beautiful religion. And the reason I loved it, what I loved about it, was the tazkit in nafs. So the real work that seemed to be taking place on the self. Mm -hmm. And again, I went to a professor. Like and that was, um, it was really sort of an academic road for me to mm -hmm. a degree. I found a professor who had a Buddhist club at the university. I attended one meeting with them. And I just, I left the meeting with a realization that while the Desgit and Nefs was very real, it wasn't for God. It was for the Nefs. And in my view, if I'm going to do something for my nephews, why am I going to, like, didn't make sense. Why am I going to purify myself for myself? I should, if I'm not going to purify myself for God, I'll just give myself whatever it wants. Right. You know, so I didn't become a Buddhist in that moment, alhamdulillah, and continued on my path. But I, by, by December, I was kind of in my impatient seven, I was 18 by now, in my impatient 18-year-old self, I was like, why haven't I found a religion yet? <laughs> and of course, other people spend a lifetime in these things. But to me, I'm like, two and a half months? That's ridiculous. What's going on? And so I was really, uh, I was, I don't even know the word. I was in this sort of state of, of frustration. That's a good word, frustration. And there were different international people on campus. And remember I said that I was really interested in other worlds and other countries and other cultures. And so there was a young man who was from another country. Almost, he, was, he was from a Muslim country. Not that I knew that. But we were talking about some intellectual thing. Actually, we were arguing, and I wasn't even, like, thinking about it. I, kept, I was thinking about my own religious struggles. So I paused the conversation. I asked him, 
what religion are you anyway? And he said, in a really funny American accent, oh, I'm Muslim. I'll never forget that funny American <laughs> accent because it sounded to me like he was really trying to be, you know, American about this and cool. And I laughed at him. I said, oh, you're one of those people who put women in closets and cover them in blankets. <laughs> he was really offended. And oh, so the wow. blessing of him being offended was that he now wanted to tell me how he wasn't that kind of person. And that was my first exposure to Islam, actually, this really funny conversation where I was telling someone, you know, you don't know anything. And uh, If you don't mind me asking, when is this? Like, I'm just trying to December put a political 1984. context here. In the 80s, right? Nine, December 1984. Wow, okay, mm-hmm. yeah. And... That conversation then, I mean, there are more details to the story, but just it turned into me really finding, it, it turned into a conversation about hijab because I accused them of being people who, of people who put women in closets and cover them with a scarf, mm-hmm. uh, a blanket. And so it turned into a conversation about hijab and I left that conversation knowing nothing about Islam, but thinking that hijab was a really cool idea. <laughs> Wow. And I thought, oh, you know, I should go to the National Organization of Women, which was a very powerful, fem- well, it wasn't powerful in the 80s, but it was a very, it was an important sort of leftover feminist organization from the 70s that I was a member of. And I thought, oh, I should go there and talk to them about this hijab. It's it's a good idea. The really, the, the real issue that was in the 80s was sexual harassment in the worst workplace. And I thought, we can look at this hijab idea and really consider how can we implement it? I mean, it was a very naive 18-year-old idea. But because I thought that, I, because my perspective about hijab changed, I thought maybe I need to give this religion a chance. And so I went and bought an English mushaf. And uh, from there, that's uh, basically... A translation of the Quran. A translation of the wow. Quran, yeah. And that was the beginning of... And, and the rest is history. And the rest is history. <laughs> Mashallah. Oh, that's really lovely to hear, you know, because I think universities are such an amazing space because I know my own husband, he he tells me how it was basically university where he discovered, even though he comes from a Muslim family, it was university where people were having those discussions yes. and you're you're away from home, uh, you're you're distant enough from your parents to have a little bit of space, I guess, to, you know, do your own thinking. Um, you're in this environment full of people who, who want to think and, and share ideas and critically think, right? Um, and people are almost like willing to try new things. Um, and I think a lot of people would say that they actually changed direction in life or discovered, you know, their path. Yeah, unfortunately, sometimes for many young Muslim people today, that direction that change of direction is going in a direction that is not good for them in this life or the next Mm. but yes i agree that university is definitely that sort of place where people begin to make their first adult decisions maybe actually what i mean is that uh, a few decades ago it was probably more likely that people would discover islam now you're right it's possibly the case that you know uh, there's so much uh, misinformation and pressure think on young people that you know um in some ways uh, a lot of parents are afraid um when they wave goodbye to their son or daughter you know going to sure, university of course yeah um what would you say like i'm just thinking like since you brought that up um if there is a parent out there who's who's about to send their child i'm, I'm actually one of them <laughs> my son <laughs> is about to go to university in a year um, and I'm thinking of sending him away from home, you know, just for him to like grow up, to be honest, and just to have that, you know, space and mm-hmm. learn to do um, his own dishes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll teach him, you know, how to clean the bathroom for the first time properly yeah. and, you know, let him uh, get out there and become independent in that sense. But I guess at the back of your mind, you, you know, you do think, hmm, hopefully he'll be meet the right people hopefully he'll make the right friends hopefully you know uh nothing will happen that will you know push him away or right. off the path so do you have any like insights or advice that you I would don't share know. it's uh it's a tough world you know mm. and um just you have to keep praying for them really i think as a mother 
our dua is really critical and we have to continue to make dua for them on a daily basis and really intense dua. You know, I'm, I, it's hard. It's tough. I don't have the answers for that. Allah hadi on all of them and sabbiton ala sirat al mustaqim because it's really, it's a tough world. I mean, yeah, it is. And you're, you're right about dua because I, I remember when I was a student in Egypt, um, my mom, it was the first time I was away from home and it was like, so far away yeah, living sure. by myself as well and I was 16 That's and so uh, <laughs> I don't know how my parents did it but my mom says to me like the one thing she did was make so much dua for me yeah. and sometimes I think about that and I think wow you know I met certain people at certain times yes. and just the right time to push push me away or pull me away from something quite negative that could have happened you know um, and just amazing things that happened and people I suddenly met out of the blue. And I was thinking, that's probably my mom's da. You know, I'm sure. Absolutely. That did that. Yeah. SubhanAllah. So never underestimate the power of Yeah. Which we have da. a tendency to do. We have a tendency to underestimate it, I think. Yeah. So it's important that we don't underestimate it. And especially as a parent, that you just keep it up. Yeah. So when you moved away from the Christian God or the Christian idea of God, what did you find in Islam when it came to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? that well i don't know that hmm, that's an interesting question i i think that coming to islam meant that i came to the religion that i believed that the god i already believed in had given to us as it's as his final religion for us mm. so i don't think necessarily my interpretation of who god was changed a lot at least not in the beginning it was actually in all honesty it was really tough entering the muslim community was not easy I struggled quite a bit. It was um, 1985. There was lots of rhetoric that was quite anti-woman. I came to Islam with much of my feminist beliefs intact. And I know the word feminism in our community is quite negative. But for me, feminism at the time meant just that, you know, I, I'm going to be treated with a measure of dignity and uh, Muslims have a tendency to talk a lot about the dignity of women, but the reality is we don't really treat them with dignity, not in our mosque spaces, very often not in our homes. Um, the the cultures that we've built around Muslim women and femininity and what it means to be Muslim women are far more connected to sort of ancient Christian ideas about womanhood instead of Quranic and uh, prophetic principles around what it means to be a woman in community and family and society and things like that. So... In 1985, it was really tough. My concept of God, however, remained steady and strong, and Islam uh, helped me to build that in beautiful ways, as far as, especially with prayer and just the the connection to knowing how does God want to be worshipped. Like that was really important. Mm-hmm. I know God, and now and I kn- now I know how God wants to be worshipped, and I was able, alhamdulillah, because of my evangelical background, I think. I was able to differentiate between the community of Muslims and Islam. As, wow, yeah. as an evangelical, the whole idea as an evangelical is there's a whole bunch of Christians that are not practicing correctly. And you mm. need to sort of reach out to them and make them better Christians. So coming to Islam and seeing the sort of the, the, the stresses that I saw in the community, what, it didn't challenge my faith. It does to many converts, many mm. converts. In fact, the statistics that I last saw were 70% of converts leave Islam, not because of issues of aqidah, but because of issues of community. And so we definitely have work to do to take care of those issues so that we can help to support our converts. Mm-hmm. But for me, alhamdulillah, I was really blessed because of my ability to sort of separate that out. Yeah. MashaAllah, that was, yeah, because I guess... Um, uh, that that is a crucial thing that often like when in dawah organizations here uh we do try to sort of emphasize that to new muslims you know that muslims are not perfect muslims are flawed often of course, as not, we should be i mean human yeah. being is flawed but i guess what i'm talking more about is not the individual that you might run into that is mm-hmm. a jerk because you know there are jerks in all groups but rather a systemic right. uh issues that we're yeah. dealing with that are so even the community uh, yeah it's the systemic issues that are the most painful mm. because those are the ones that you feel like there's approval of there's sort of general approval and you wonder is this from the quran is this from the sunnah because it's systemic and so it takes quite a bit of 
uh, reflection and learning to understand that it isn't. So can you like pinpoint one or two like stark things that that you experience that? Um, I think really the one real basic issue that all Muslim women deal with is the whole issue of the mosque. That our mosques that were built with beautiful architectural uh intentions and the study of islamic architecture is the study of a of a of a study of how to raise people's hearts Mm -hmm. how to help people focus on allah in this in this space of spirituality and then we architecturally teach women that they don't matter we architecturally teach women that they're marginalized we give them little rooms on the side we build ugly walls Mm -hmm. between them or put dirty curtains between them and the main space we teach women that they don't have to listen to the khutbah or the main speaker because anyway the speaker can't see them and so they sit (laughs) in a space where they can just sit and chat with each other then we blame women for their bad behavior but we've never really taught them in a in a communal way, how to live in a larger space. The Prophet Adam's mosque was one space. Right. The women, the, the the women were in the back, the men were in the front, and children were generally in the middle. Yeah. And so the children felt in between the parents, and they were watched. Our children run like wild animals. God, I hate to say that, but it's really sad. Not because there's something wrong with our children or our parenting. Because we haven't taught them, we haven't given them a space of sacredness. We don't teach them this is a sacred space. Come here and sit down with us. Let's sit and learn together. Let's worship together. They're running around. Women are separated. In fact, one of the really dangerous things that's happening today is after 20 years of this separation and women praying behind a screen often is that women have begun to believe that fuqhan, it's all right to pray behind a screen. So you'll find women at home following a screen from the Kaaba or some other person, which is fuqhan la yujuz. Like, that's not even okay. But we've taught them in the mosques. Oh, it's okay. Stand behind a screen and follow the imam. Mm-hmm. That you can't see. You're not behind the lines. Like there are really some serious fuqh yeah, questions yeah, yeah. around here. The, but that's not the question's not about fuqh. The question is really the the architectural message we're giving women. And and worse than that is a woman who is many women I've known who they need to pray. They're not al- in, they're not allowed into an empty male section. Male mm-hmm. Because and no, pray on the street instead, which is it's that's an utterly ridiculous. That's just ridiculous so, and so far from the prophetic sunnah that it's not even it's it's just really frightening, actually. Absolutely. I mean, there there was <laughs> there was literally no barrier between the men and women uh, in the Prophet's mosque in hey. Medina, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, wa 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 except the bar- the barrier of taqwa, I guess. <laughs> you know, the 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 barrier that a person has. You know, that you, and that's you put how in you your learn heart. to mm. have a pro- how to interact with people too. Right. So we have this other real hypocrisy going on in our community, which is that at the mosque. You know, women can't even be in the sacred prayer area. They've got to be shunted off somewhere else. But the same community at the coffee shop, at work, oh, yeah. at school, in the malls, whatever, is everywhere. quite free. In fact, more so than they yeah. should be, more than likely. Yeah. And so we're really, we have a lot of issues. But the the issue as far as like the messaging to women, the systemic issue of the mosque is what I'm, I'm really concerned about. Because we're teaching young girls, you don't matter here. Mm. And I, I think, uh, like you said, people have fiqh and started to think that, you know, these barriers, etc. I think people have even started to think that it's kind of like impermissible for a woman to be to set foot in that space. You know, right. like it's it's gone to that extent. That, yeah. which, and, which has meant for many women in personal stories that they have instead of being able to pray inside of a mosque on a day that they needed to pray, let's say, Dhuhr, they had to pray in the street. How I've heard about this yes, happening to we've sisters. All heard. Yeah. And so how does this make any prophetic sense? I just think about the brother who had the who has the audacity, the audacity yeah. to say to his sister in Islam, Yes, the mosque is empty, but we don't have a woman's space, so you have to pray outside. Pray outside, exposing her to God knows what. I mean, even just the words of the Prophet وسلم, saying do not prevent the female servants of Allah from the houses of Allah. That should ring in brothers' ears. Of course. You know, and that should scare them. Absolutely. <laughs> Subhanallah. Because that's a direct disobedience to the Prophet. ﷺ. If you tell a woman, you cannot come in here to pray, you are in direct disobedience to the Prophet. ﷺ. And yeah, it, it's, it's one of those things that annoys me as well. <laughs> yeah. And, and, um, and it does annoy mm. me, but the, the more concerning to the annoyance is the systemic issue. Mm. Because it's it's become something we've all we all accept. 
Well, I think there was an excuse maybe in the early days where mosques were first being set up, you know, maybe brothers might have, people might have an excuse that, okay, we, we've we only got a limited amount of money, we need to make this. Are you talking but, about the early days in the UK? Yeah, like when so, immigrants first came and so maybe they... So immigrants are coming from a background where women did not go to the mosque. Right. And I will say... Especially from Asian <clears throat> And I will countries, say, yeah. yes, I will mm. say that geogra- across geographies, in across the world, women led very private lives before the let's say nineteenth or eighteenth century. Mm-hmm. Before the I don't know what century, but there is a lot for for thousands of years. Women led private lives. Not only Muslim women, women we led private lives between mm-hmm. raising children and in families. And generally speaking, like even in Western culture, we had this thing called a coming out party. Why is there a coming out party? Because women loved such led such private lives. She needed to quote unquote come out so she could be seen by other men so she could be chosen for marriage and so the the private lives of women uh, even and uh, sorry if i just make may make a footnote it just astounds me at the beauty of the prophet said them that in this large world where women really led private lives that still he would say la tamna do not prevent imat allah min masajid allah don't prevent these the female the women from from the mosques even though most women, I mean, it was, they led a private life. Mm. So, but today the issue is women are living public lives. <laughs> yeah. Everywhere. We are in the coffee shop. We are in the grocery <clears throat> store. We are at work. Even if we are in the public schools with our children. Even a woman who is a homeschooling mom, focus 100% on a number of children at home, maybe caring for her parents or in-laws as well. She's also in the public life. She's still because that's how we have to live our life. We have to go buy things. We have to go places, and so the that we are now in the public life, but our mosques are not accepting us or embracing us. That's where the real modern issue is. I think mm-hmm. that we've got to face the arf of the time. We have to face what's happening today. And the immigrants that came, they came and they built mosques that were like the mosques that they had mm. at home. But they, they have to recognize that those mosques were built often or lived in often because of colonial peer, colonial or post-colonial dictatorship mm-hmm. rules. Yeah. And so mosques that closed between prayer times, that's not a Muslim thing. Mm. That's a colonial or post-colonial dictatorship thing. In order to prevent Muslims to gather so they don't create groups that will go against the, the colonial or post-colonial dictatorship government. Mm-hmm. And so... We need to do some real self-reflection and thinking about yeah. why are our mosques the way they are. And then we need to just get brave and have some courage and commit ourselves to the way of the process and them and change them. Absolutely. I think um, one of the things my uh, teacher, Sheikh Akram Nadwi, he highlighted, he's written a book about this, you know, the women yes. in the mosques. And one of the things he highlighted was, <clears throat> especially in the Indian subcontinent, um, often there was like, there were times of fear and danger where scholars would give fatawa that the women should not go to the mosque okay uh because of you know colonial violence issues and also between war. between uh you know different factions and sure. things like that and so they would give a fatwa and then those fatawa would end up becoming enshrined ah, gotcha. and then the next generation would think that's the norm rather yes. than a fatwa for a specific you know time situation. and situation so so yeah, I mean, I think, I, I do feel that I, I am seeing changes, you know. Alhamdulillah. Uh, we've got this beautiful new mosque in Cambridge that's just been built. Other mosques as well. Like I know a lot of sisters who are involved in their local mosque who have a say, who I know that it's not widespread and it's not everywhere. Yeah. But I I do believe that the the, the generations coming up, they are becoming more open-minded i think i agree with you and i think that i in the united states as well more and more mosques are being built with the prophet's mosque in mind right and really considering this in fact the newest mosque in minnesota was built like that it's beautiful and i like it because it has big windows too i'm a windows lady so (laughs) Uh, yeah i think you're right i think one of the things i loved about egypt was how passionate the ladies were to go to the mosque yeah you know like in cairo Uh, they would be carrying their babies they would have their everything you know and yeah. and they just wanted to be there like yeah. obviously especially in ramadan but even outside of ramadan and ju- for juma they felt as passionately you know uh to go and uh obviously the mosques are very big and spacious right. so in yeah. malaysia too i loved malaysia because of the mosques mm. they were and they were open spaces 
and it, yeah, it was really, so you it's could like go a big square, see, isn't it? You could see the Marshall. whole thing, you know. I mean, this thing about going to see a beautiful mosque and then not being able to actually see it is really sad. So yeah, I really I, yeah. I appreciated that Malaysian uh, experience for myself as well. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Mashallah. So, um, uh, Sheikh Hatam, Sheikh Hatam, wait, let me say it again. Rhymes with camera. <laughs> Can you say on camera that that is the correct? Yes, my Because I don't name. want people criticizing <laughs> saying, oh, she can't even pronounce so it. So my name, it right, my name is Tamra. It's my birth name. My mother named me Tamra. Actually, my grandmother named me Tamra. Rhymes with camera. So okay. all around the world, Muslims are calling me things like Tamaro and Tamara and things like this. But I'm working on... Helping them pronounce my name correctly. It's Tamra. Yeah. So I am pronouncing your name correctly. Yes, you are. I appreciate it, it so much. Thank Shefa you. Shefa Tamra. Yes. Um, thank you for sharing your journey with us. Um, I love the way uh, from the videos and content that I've seen uh, uh, that you've produced online. I love the way you call sisters, not just to talk about their rights and, you know, but also to take responsibility. Mm. I find that really refreshing uh, because we are in a time where rights are talked about a lot. Mm. Um, I'll give you an example and maybe you can elaborate on it. Um, recently, you, uh, I think it was last Ramadan, uh, there was a video you did with a sister who had uh, made up all her fasts. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us uh, a little bit about that situation? And Well, the fasting, the whole fasting issue is really an important <laughs> one because yeah. a few years back, I put a post up on Facebook about the fuqah of fasting and one of the it was it was a very general sort of boring post but it became something very exciting for for uh many some people and my point in one of the points i made in this which is a very valid fuqah point is that a pregnant or nursing woman is not automatically it's not automatic it's not i'm pregnant so i don't fast or i'm nursing so i don't fast and that became a very sort of touchy subject for many people. And I don't know why, because what I'm actually saying is you as a woman are going to make this decision. Mm. And you're going to make this decision based on a number of different factors, keeping in mind the spiritual benefits of fasting for your unborn child. Anyway, so Leslie, who I did the video with, before, she's in Minnesota with me. So she, I, the first time I had said that to her, she was surprised because she had been told the second you're pregnant or nursing, there's no fasting. Automatic. Automatic. And mm. so she had three young boys and she had not fasted for their pregnancy or their nursing. Oh. And she had... Oh, that's a lot of fasts. It was... She had something <laughs> like 200 and something days of fasting. And, Subhanallah. Yes. And she determined, mashallah, to go ahead and make them up. Wow. And I was so proud of her. And she... It was hard work. What she would do is in the winter time, she would do a lot of fasting. Mm -hmm. And then in the summer, do... I don't know if she did any or she just did much less. And over a period, I think of three years, she finished all those years of fasting that she had accumulated. And so we did that. We had a party for her as well. We got her cake. Muslims love cake, you know. And uh, we got she her She deserved cake. a party. Oh, she definitely that. deserved yeah. a party. And, I, and also I think it was important for me to let women know that you can make these up and yep. you can make this decision about fasting. Right. It is not an automatic as much as... Yeah. Uh, that's a rumor going around. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, like you said, like everyone's different. There, there might be and every some pregnancy people... is different. Yeah, right. Right. I mean, there are pregnancies where you might be just fine, and it also depends yeah. on the time of year. What when is when is Ramadan? Yeah, it depends, and how you, your age. It, there's so many factors, but that's the mm. point. You look at the factor. You work with your doctor. You work with your doctor, and you consider, and preferably a doctor. We, I like to say preferably a Muslim doctor, but I think what I want to say is a doctor who understands the importance of the fast and the right. spiritual benefits of the fast for the unborn child as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I have been through four pregnancies and four bouts of <clears throat> breastfeeding. <laughs> yes. And um, I, it just so happened that I found it okay, you know. And, um, and many, I, many I found, no, do, found no excuse not to. And mm. uh, I, I even checked out with my doctor just to make sure. And my doctor... Non-Muslim doctor, she yeah. said to me, uh, you know what, your baby will adjust, you know, yeah. they'll, f they'll eat when you eat and they'll get the nutrition no matter what, you know. Uh, and she said to me, uh, you know, you'll be fine because yeah. in every other way I was fine. And, and so I never actually missed any. In fact, 
it was better than normal because right. obviously normally women have their men menstrual cycle and uh for me it was like especially like, yeah, yeah i don't have to right. make anything up right right it's great absolutely i agree yeah yeah and what a blessing alhamdulillah yeah, yeah so uh, and like you said that we can't underestimate the spiritual benefit of these things because i think uh, i don't know what you think about this but sometimes sisters complain about you know like feeling low feeling lack of iman and things like that and sometimes we don't make that connection that you know these things that allah has given us these uh, acts of ibadah right they are the cure to that they help us with that absolutely mm. yeah so uh, when that sister so she made up all her fasts yes mashallah congratulations sister leslie leslie yes uh from here from London, okay. London. <laughs> from all of us we, we we see you as a role model mashallah, mashallah. that was excellent um but also i i heard you in another talk talking about the epidemic of missing prayers mm. uh you see for me I, i find that refreshing because sometimes people want us to talk like as public speakers and stuff they want us to talk about side issues and other kind of popular topics mm -hmm. But sometimes it's those fundamentals, isn't it, that mm -hmm. need to be revisited. So, mm -hmm. Yes, well, we have an epidemic. And, and we are a community that expects a lot. We want uh, to be in a better place uh, in our families, in our communities. And we want to change our stereotypes. But we aren't putting in the effort. There's an epidemic of missed prayers. Amongst those missed prayers, there are two types. There are the missed prayers that are made up. And then there are those that are not made up. In percent, I, I often ask in the audience, what do you think the percentage of people in the world are that pray all five prayers a day on time? Let me ask you, what do you think in all of your interactions with people? Of all the Muslims in the world. All the Muslims in the world. Unfortunately, I think it is because I've lived in certain countries yeah. and I've seen the mosques empty, uh, you know, Adhan is going but nobody's turning up and... I hate to say it, 20%? I, I, would, I would think it's even lower. I don't have uh, reality statistics about that. I think it's actually a research it would be really important for people to do. But um, in my personal experience with people, now, of course, it depends. If you're thinking about people that don't pray at all, maybe yeah. you're, you're, it is around 20%. But if we're talking about people that pray sometimes, whatever. So we're talking about a Muslim community. One of our, the rikin of our, of our life, the pillar of our life of faith includes salah, this ritual prayer. And as a community, mm -hmm. we are missing. Now, when we talk about women, it gets even more intense because for women, once a month, we're menstruating, as you earlier referred to. With our prayer, we don't have to make that up. But we're struggling for the habit, especially if we come to this attitude of, I'm on vacation. I'm. I, this is a week of ghafla, a week of mm -hmm. heedlessness. And this is somehow a message that has been passed back and forth amongst Muslim women. And we have to learn how to have different language. I think <laughs> we should start to talk about this time. That is, in Arabic, you say, Mali salah, I don't have prayer. Mm -hmm. I think the translation of that is dangerous psychologically. Uh, maybe in Arabic it's not such a big deal because salah is separate from dua and dhikr. But in English, we have one word for all three. And so instead of saying, I don't have prayer, we can say, I'm in my week of dhikr. Wow. I'm yeah. in my week of dua and dhikr. I love that. I'm really focusing this week on my on my the beating of my heart. And if we can start think thinking like that, Absolutely. because if we add it up, if just do a little bit of math and we think that from the beginning of a woman's menstrual life until the end, really I know everyone is different, but just sort of typical <laughs> average woman, yeah, thirteen yeah, yeah. to fifty two, let's say. Uh I figured it out once with I think thirteen to fifty five or thirteen to fifty, I don't remember. It adds up to 10 years of our life, not in, in menstruating, 10 years. That, so if those 10 years, we consider them vacation, God forbid, from Allah, <laughs> or I'm not praying. So it's a week of heedlessness. That means that we have 10 years of our life without any connection to Allah. What is that? That's scary. And that's not from Islam. That's from our own culture that we've built. That's not Islam mm -hmm. telling us that, that we have to do this. And yes, you can respond to me by saying, well, isn't it such that if you if you pray regularly and then you're not praying because you're menstruating, you get the same reward? Absolutely. But if we are coming to that with an attitude of vacation, mm -hmm. I'm coming to this with an attitude of, I'm not connecting to Allah this week. 
Yeah. That's really a spiritual question. And so what happens is when we come back after this week, we're reestablishing the habit again and again. Instead of saying, well, even during this week, even if I sit down, in, at least Fajr, at least the one that people are struggling with, at least Fajr, I'm waking up anyway. I'm mm-hmm. holding my masbaha. I'm reading my dua book. I'm just saying astaghfar for, and even if it's three minutes, mm-hmm. just having a moment where you say, I am still this yeah. Muslim believing person and I I'm want to connect with you. still a worshiper of Allah. Yeah, Allah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm still a worshiper of Allah, yeah. SubhanAllah, that's, uh, it's, it's, that's so true. I mean, and I think what happens also is sometimes you can, in a way, get out of practice, you know, and then mm-hmm. kind of have to struggle to reestablish your habits of purity and, you yes. know, all of those things. And um, then you have this sort of waiting. So a woman who has finished her period, is she, how many days after that does she wait till she gets back to the prayer? Yeah. We have a lot, of, a lot of conversations to have with one another and a lot of work to do about taking seriously the most important relationship in our life, which is the relationship between us and Allah, before the one with our husband, before the one with our children, before the one with our friends or even our parents, is the relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can't neglect it. We just cannot neglect it. I think the the great thing about you highlighting that, the whole topic of salah and the epidemic of missing prayers, is that, you know, as like you said, as an ummah, we want Allah to make us the greatest people. Right? Yes. We, we want Allah to uh, take away this oppression, to take away, you know, the difficult situations Muslims find themselves in around the world. Mm-hmm. And yet the first and most important act of worship and command of Allah's, which is worship me and, you know, pray those five prayers, yeah. we're neglecting and we're expecting, you know, miracles to come down from the sky to help and us what out. what I, I like to remind people of is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to tahajjud, which is the night prayer, the, I w- the most important sunnah, I would mm-hmm. say, in the tahajjud time, and refers to this in the Quran, he speaks to the Prophet Sallam as pray to Hajjud so that you can reach Maqam and Mahmuda, a praiseworthy uh, maqam, station. station. Yeah. And so as a community, if we want to reach a praiseworthy station, station. we need to not only be praying our Fadl prayers, we need to be praying to Hajjud. And I really I think Tahajjud is a keystone habit, so I would recommend to people that even if you're struggling with your five daily prayers, go ahead and start intending for Tahajjud. It is going to just pull everything into shape and you'll really find yourself doing much better in those five prayers as well. Yeah, and I, I think it's about holding ourselves to a minimum standard. Certainly. Like most of us would feel disgusted by not brushing our teeth twice a day, right? right. <laughs> like we would be I disgusted. <laughs> we, yeah, yeah. we would probably not sleep well if we just went to sleep without, yes. right? Because it's so ingrained in us that this is a must for mm. me. Um, and I've seen people who ne- didn't used to pray become, you know, devout devout worshippers of Allah, praying their five prayers and even more. Um, and I think the main switch that took place in their mind was that, you know, this is a must. This is yeah. like my basic hygiene, my basic sure. everyday, like, it's going to keep me alive, you know. It keeps my spirit living. Right. Absolutely. And I think yeah. when that switch takes place, you know, um, it becomes easier yeah. uh, for people to kind of... Um, Commit. Commit, yeah. Mm. Because we're committing to things all the time. Oh, certainly. It's not like people who are not committed to salah are not committed to anything. Of course. Right? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> it's is, is it an important enough thing in your mind that mm-hmm. you've made your relationship with Allah number one? Um, yeah, so jazakallah khairan for that. Um you touched on the top topic of harassment uh, and you, you mentioned it in another context. Uh, but I was thinking about this topic recently and, um, you know, just the whole fact that, like you said, in the public space now, there's a lot more mixing of men and women. And even in Muslim women, Muslim organizations, mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot of brothers and sisters working together. Mm-hmm. Um Recently in a seminary that I was studying in, they had a policy that they brought out and they, which I thought was great, you know, they uh, kind of, I don't know what they called it, gender interaction policy or something like this, uh, where they kind of highlighted to the brothers and to the sisters uh, what the kind of code of conduct was going to be for the organization. But also what I thought was great was 
how sisters or brothers, you know, could report any kind of uh, infraction, right, that took yeah. place. And they made it really clear. And I, I'm guessing that this isn't normal for all Muslim organizations, which is why it's, it stands out. And they made it really clear that we are here to listen. You know, if if there are any complaints from female, especially they said to fem the female students, you know, um, because most of the teachers are male. Right. Um, and they do have a barrier, but not really full barrier. It's just a barrier between the male and female students, mm -hmm. but not the teachers there. You right. know? Um, and obviously you have to work with teachers to do different things like work on dissertations. And so they made it very clear that we are going to listen, mm -hmm. you know. And and you should never be afraid to to approach us. And I thought that was great, you know. Yeah, mashallah. Um, what are your observations about Muslim organizations and what they can do to prevent kind of spiritual problems? Abuse. Yeah, spiritual abuse. Well, I think it's really important to. I think that listening piece, bravo, Alion. Yeah, because really. the what's really happening with Muslim women is that they're afraid to report. They're afraid to not be believed. They're afraid to be ostracized. They're afraid to lose their place in the community that they've worked so hard in, in, in establishing that either as a student or, or what have you. So I think that's critical, and I'm, I'm really impressed and, and happy with that policy, and I hope that it's successful for them. And hopefully they won't have any problems at all. Mm -hmm. But um, if, they, if they do, I, I really am happy with the listening. I think that's really important. Um, <clears throat> I think as a community, we need to just be able to be aware that spiritual abuse is real. And in the United States, Dr. Ingrid Matson is doing a really wonderful job. She has something called the Hurma Project. And she's, in fact, there's a conference coming up in January around it where she's really looking for real solid research in this area, how we can learn from other uh, groups and, and how then we can apply that in our own community. I think it's difficult because when we're talking about spiritual abuse, we have a lot of complicated pieces here around mm -hmm. uh, how do we discipline. Uh, people are asking me, is there repentance? So if there is a person who spiritually abused women or sexually abused them or harassed them, is there repentance? Can he come back to take that position again? It's an interesting question. Uh, and you know, I don't. I don't, certainly don't claim to have all the answers. For me, what's important is that we protect women, mm -hmm. and mostly that we protect their faith, because I think that spiritual abuse or sexual abuse within the spiritual uh, community or spiritual relationship is more dangerous than any other kind, because it it can affect your aqida, mm -hmm. it can affect your ability to hold on to your religion, and so it's not just a threat to your dunya; it's right. a threat to your dunya and your akhirah. And so in that space, I'm very concerned with protecting women. And uh, I think we need to have ways to... We, we want to make sure that men who are predators are not moving from one community to the next as they're kicked out. So I think that's yeah. outside of listening. Probably the second thing is to have a way to communicate between organizations so that yeah, if you fire someone, they're not just going to the next organization working there and you at your organization not being honest with them about why he was fired. I think that we do have to be professionally responsible. Right. And other than that, you know, we have to, I, I certainly hope for redemption for, for anyone, but we mm -hmm. have to be really responsible and be concerned about the victims and, and take care of them. In general, though, also, like, uh, sometimes I get complaints from, or not really complaints, but I get contacted by sisters asking for advice. And this isn't related to abuse, but this is about gender interactions in general, mm -hmm. right? Um, I get contacted and unfortunately it's becoming more common. Uh, sisters calling me and, ask, and and really distraught about the fact that their husband works in a Muslim organization where there are a lot of sisters, <laughs> okay? And uh, they feel that it's negatively impacted their marriage. So this is a completely different thing, you know? I'm not right. talking about harassment. Well, that's certainly because the... <laughs> You know, the, we have so much to work on. And yeah. I think for a, a practicing Muslim man, to be fair, he probably has more, I'd say, barriers up for himself internally between him and the non-Muslim world yeah. because he doesn't consider them an option. But with the Muslim practicing woman, she becomes very attractive to him. 
And if the Muslim women are kind of flirtatious and bringing tea and, you know, sweet and nice, he's only seeing them at work. He goes home and he sees a woman who is tired and exhausted and needs a break from the kids. And he's like, yeah. Where is, why are you not, you know, <laughs> cute with me? Like, so-and-so is cute with me at work. Oh. That's not an ex- that's not uh, at no. all. No way. Uh, I, I, I don't want to be misunderstood here. I'm not saying that that's okay. I'm mm-hmm. saying that's what's happening. Yeah. I don't know that for the woman at home, that there's an actual solution for that. She has to just really be the, um, she needs to just really, she needs to get strong with Allah so that she can have her life and be pleased with her life and, uh, and create a beautiful family as much as she can for the women. I mean, I'm a predator man and a predator woman are both in sin. So Mm. if you are a woman who is flirting with your boss or with men at work, thinking I might become their second wife. You are a predator. And if you're breaking up the first family, there is sin in that. I mean, it, we're not in, in the UK, as far as I know, in the United States, at least I do know that, it's not legal to have a second marriage. And so if you're entering into that marriage, you're entering into it without legal papers. And so you're denying yourself rights, legal rights of the marriage and divorce and all the other things. And you're also possibly breaking up that first family. So if you're capable of standing for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with that I broke up a family for but, my desire I mean that's pretty scary stuff Sheikha Tamara um, you know we're talking uh, what, what I like about our conversation is we're talking not just about you know men and where they need to pull their socks up but also you know we can talk about women and where no, they, need to they need to pull their socks, pull their socks up. up their socks should already be there <laughs> right <laughs> <might say>. and um, <laughs> Uh, what I want to like one of the things that I'm noticing is sometimes it's not even about somebody wanting to become a second wife Um, Mm. I think sometimes unfortunately it's just the culture of over you know any interaction too much interaction Mm. too much chit chat at the end of the day men and women enjoy flirting you know there's there's a there's a certain aspect of that even that chase you know mm-hmm. you don't necessarily have to have it doesn't have right it doesn't have to achieve anything at the end just that interaction mm-hmm. there's fitna in it there's a spark in it right sure there's danger in it i would mm-hmm. say um and i think it's I'm, i wonder what you think about this i think it's up to sisters and brothers to have their own internal checklist i guess of um you know, uh, what the barriers are, what the lines are, you know, um, and how mm. to keep themselves. Like, for example, one organization that I was in, um, we we had this policy. I'm not saying that it's a must, but it, it certainly helped that when we would, um, you know, like uh, send emails to one another, and especially because it was so often, you know, and these are people who you're going to meet regularly, uh, we would have somebody else in that email interaction. Um and although that might not be obligatory, right? There's lots of things that are not obligatory, right? Sure. But the, but we impose on ourselves um, because we know that shaitan is there. Um, and I, I certainly noticed that um, the emails where somebody else is present <laughs> are way more formal and way more, you know, sensible sure. than, than the ones where you, know, you become a bit lazy, you become a bit lax. So, And shaitan doesn't get to us overnight right. Right? these de- these relationships inappropriate relationships they don't develop overnight um it's khutwa khutwa isn't it it's mm-hmm. step by step so yeah i wonder what your thoughts are on that well um I, I have a couple generally the advice i give people women or men but women are the ones who are usually talking to me is that when you're in a workplace whatever that workplace is or at school as a student and you have yeah. to be in work groups with mm-hmm. men and girls and boys men and women the word to carry with you is professional. I'm a professional. And because when, you're, when we think of the word professional, we really understand what that means. We understand that there is a certain way of sitting, a certain decorum, a certain way of talking, that we are not becoming lazy in that. And I think mm-hmm. that word helps us to hold on to the, the uh, Islamic precepts of interaction between any human being. And I think really adab, and uh, good behavior and manners is something that 
is always best done in the public space. So even, and also to be honest with you, I think work gets done better when we're all talking in front of each other. So I run an international global organization. Uh, we have people, volunteers from all over the world. And we, I use WhatsApp actually for much of our communication. And we are all women, okay? So I'm not concerned about some of the things that mm. you're talking about. But still, I'm always pushing people talk in the public thread. So we'll have a thread for, let's say, Ribat, our online, our Ribat team. And if someone from that team talks to me privately and asks me something, I'll say, why are you asking me privately? Go back to the team. Ask in front of the team. It's a learning for everyone else. It helps us create policy. It helps us to know what's going on in the organization. I'm talking about that because you're talking about the emails that have a third person on them. Yeah. I think that's very healthy. Not just for the personal, professional interaction, to remember that we're professionals, but also it's helpful for the organization to have the more people involved in a conversation. Once we learn to speak in front of people, we begin to remember that even when we're private, we're always in front of Allah. And in this day and age where everything is saved and everything can be screenshot <laughs> and everything can be sent yeah, anywhere, sure. we need to know really well that nothing is private. I never say anything without realizing that what I'm saying can be screenshotted. I hope, I hope that my taqwa is more than that, that I know that the screenshot is going to Allah first. I really hope that. But I'm human, like everyone else. And I include in my Allah sees my screenshot with human beings could see it as well. And I need to make sure that everything I say is within my own, my own definition of what it means to be mm -hmm professional, a woman of taqwa, a woman of iman and faith, hopefully ihsan, working on all of these things. So we need to talk about this in our, our Muslim workplaces. We need to talk about Islam, iman, ihsan. Allah sees us. Allah's watching the screenshot idea. And I certainly would encourage all Muslim organizations to discourage private conversations and really include the work in public discourse so that we can all learn and grow together and understand what the culture and ethos is of that organization. Yeah, I think really important to, to remember that none of us is immune. Because I think sometimes when we're working in a Muslim organization, we think we're, we're doing Allah's work, right? Mm, we're, good point. So we start thinking we're immune to a lot of things, you know? Yeah, um, that's right. And that, that's a door for shaitan. Yeah, absolutely. Jazakallah khairan. And so, Sheikh Tamra, uh, I'm going to ask you, like, I'm going to graduate like in a few weeks. Oh, <laughs> Alhamdulillah, I've got my graduation. And uh, it's been a long time, like, of study and because uh, I did it with kids and all that kind of thing. Sure. Um, I'm going to be giving a speech and I'm going to be giving advice to fellow students of knowledge. So this is uh -huh. people who've studied, you know, advanced Islamic studies, um, the Sharia, etc. Um, can you give me some ideas? <laughs> <laughs> what advice would you give, especially the female students, but somebody who wants to be in it for the long haul, you know? I think that the advice I generally give people uh, who want to be in it for the long haul, I like that, that I sentence. I need a pen. I need a pen. <laughs> <laughs> I'll well, just it's watch recorded, the, yeah, so you'll I'll watch the recording. Re do a speed fast forward or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, are three things. One is that, so the advice I, I often give to women on this path, especially that are further along the path, is that we need three things, all of us, and I include myself in this. We need a solid solid ibadah schedule and that is critical i can't emphasize it enough and those need to be it needs to be a number of hours in the day and it has to be include must include tahajjud and preferably it will include uh dhikr and dua and things that you will hold even when you are menstruating obviously quran and that needs to be solid and it needs to be, we need to be committed to it and it needs to be always. And if there's a day or two because of our schedule that it becomes less, we make it up. And so that's really, that's a critical point. And without that solid basis of ibadah, what's going to happen is that as we speak about Islam, people will begin to eat our religion. And because if we're not refilling, people are eating. Like we're basically, we're feeding people, right? We can think about this in a spiritual way. We're feeding people of our knowledge. We're feeding people of hopefully the light that we are pulling from our own relationship. And so as we feed people that, we're giving. So we need to, we need to replenish. And mm -hmm. if we're not replenishing, we'll find ourselves one day uh, empty. 
And uh, there's a fuqa, uh, mabad, uh, there's a principle of fuqa which says, if you have, I know you know it, but I'll say it for the podcast, which is if you have only enough water to make wudu with, you, it's not good charity or good, it's not good to give that, you don't give it away. You hold it for yourself because you need to make wudu. And so in the same way with religion, we don't want to give it all away. We have to continue to fill. Otherwise, we're going to end up, God forbid, in a space where we ourselves are dealing with all the diseases of the people we're working with. Because when you're working with people, you're soaking up their issues. You're soaking up their problems. Mm -hmm. And so you're going home with them. And you need to get rid of them. And the only way to do that and come back to yourself, or I shouldn't say the only way, one of the critical ways to do that and come back to yourself is through a solid ibadah schedule. That's number one. Number two, it's uh, suhba. You must cho- choose your choose your people. Choose your people. And you need to have someone who is older than you who can continue to help you along the way. Or let's say older than you on the path a little bit. It doesn't have to be... It can be a few years. or, And then also a sister along the path, someone who's walking with you on this path. Both of those are really important, one or two or three or four or more, even better, depending on if you're extrovert or in- introvert, I suppose. But that sohbah is critical because we need to have a person who's going to tell us, no, not like right. that. No, that's not. No, no, no. Hang on a minute. That's <laughs> n- that's not a good idea. Yeah. And we also need to, people who are going to say, what you're about to do is scary, but be brave. That's important. And we need people who are going to say to us just, you know, hey, you need a cup of tea <laughs> or <laughs> coffee or whatever it is you like to drink. Or maybe just I'll come over and watch your kids for a minute while you go back to that solid ibadah schedule that you need to have some time with. So we need that suhbah and people we can be honest and real with because there's a level of vulnerability that I know that is a, all leaders struggle with. How vulnerable will we be? I tend to over share be a little bit overly vulnerable and people look at me and think, wait, are you actually a teacher in this world? Because you're just way too, people will say that, like literally say that to me. Like, I don't know. (laughs) Someone told me you're a, you're a religious teacher, but you're just a little bit too down to earth for that. (laughs) You laugh too much. Oh, they expect you to be. Yeah, a little bit more serious, right? I'm just not quite serious enough. I have jokes and things like this. But anyway, but we need people to be vulnerable with and to be ourselves with. And the third thing I'll say is that ilm never ends. We want to continue to learn and make sure that as we are continuing to learn, we are following sort of a systemic process. And I think actually, I want to say something else. So that's four. I have to. I may have to find five then because I have a. I have to have an odd number, you know. But um, it's very important to become a planner. So even if you're not a planner, become a planner so that you can fit in all things into your life. Otherwise, you may get overwhelmed. And there's a lot of demand on women in this world, in this field, a lot of demand. And to sort of pick out, oh, my fifth is going to be get an assistant. There, that's a good one. (laughs) (laughs) So get an assistant, uh, be a planner, pick out what's important, where you're going to speak and when. Know that things will change, that your life will change, your, and, 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 Make sure that you are controlling your message, whatever, wherever that is, whether it's in the digital world or in the sort of face-to-face world or both. Make sure your purpose, you're reaching a goal, you're, you're reaching towards something. And, you know, write your own mission statement. You know, positive cultural change through creative educational experiences is mine. And it's part of Robota. It is this whole organization. But everywhere I go, I want to talk about positive cultural change. Everywhere I go, I want to create a new educational experience. To me, being on your podcast today is an educational experience for others and, of course, for me as well. But it's also an educational experience. It's something that people will be able to hopefully experience with us and live with us. And so when you are focused on your goal, make a plan and be clear. Hopefully you won't burn out. You have to fight burnout. Fight burnout. Get help in the house. If you don't have someone coming in to clean your house, get someone to come in to clean your house at least once a month. So all the deep stuff somebody else can do. If you say you can't afford it, start charging more for your lectures. <laughs> it's really important. Or, we, or there just won't be time to do everything that we need to do. Seek barakah in our time, of course, through our ibadah and through all the things that we're doing. But at the same time, recognize that it's okay to get help. Sometimes women don't want to have help. It's okay to have help. I have a cleaning lady 
I'm very happy Good job. that I have, she's my, she's part of my team. I consider yes, her to absolutely. be part of my team because I don't think I could do a lot of things if 100%. I didn't have that help. Absolutely. My early days when I was working full time, studying full time and then working part time and giving classes, there is no way, no way I could have done that without a regular mm-hmm. woman who absolutely is part of my life now. And may God bless her. And, and mashallah, she, she has been blessed in many ways already. Jazakallah khairan, Sheikh Tamara. Uh, it's been so wonderful. I mean, I'm going to be using those tips <laughs> in my graduation speech, inshallah. Um, it's been wonderful to meet you. And I look forward to one day coming to America to visit you. Come for our literary conference. Since I you are a writer, so. I would I love to so. have you there. And if I may, tell people where to find me. If they want sure, to find sure, me, sure, they sure, can sure. find me on Twitter at Tamara L. Gray. Also on Facebook, Dr. Tamara Gray, I think is what it is there. I'm also on Instagram at Tamara L. Gray. And my organization is called Rabata, R-A-B-A-T-A, dot org. Registration is open now for our online academic uh, institute where we teach a full curriculum of Islamic studies, Quran, and Arabic. Wow. And awesome. we have two certificate programs, one Islamic teachers, also an Islamic teachers uh, studies certificate, Islamic studies teachers certificate, and also a religious leadership certificate. And the goal is to to create a tide, a rising tide of Muslim women leaders in all of our communities that have a good grasp on ilm, tarbiyah, and can help everyone live in the shelter of one another. I've also written a book called Joy Jots. It's in its yes. second edition. We have an online book club on Telegram that you can join. It's called Joy Jots Book Club Broadcast. And if you're not familiar with Telegram, it's really easy. You can just go there and then click the discuss button at the bottom and be part of that weekly discussion. I mentioned the literary conference. And mashallah, your book just re- recently won uh, in best cover. So congratulations. Yeah. And I really do hope you can come and present about what it means to be a writer for you here yeah. in the UK. Inshallah. And that's in Minnesota in November. We also have an Ibadah retreat in October. Every summer we have a Ribat retreat. We have a lot going on all around educational experiences to help us create positive cultural change within our personal selves and our families and our communities and hopefully really uplift, bring us all to Maqam and Mahmouda to this Ameen. lofty station. And uh, actually talking about that, we have Tehajud threads as well on WhatsApp for those who would like to be encouraged, encouraged. to wake up and yeah. they're in different time zones. For any of our, our worship programs, you can email circlesoflight at rabata.org and get information about Tehajud threads, information about the Joy Jots book club, uh, information about our Ibadah retreat, all of those things. Otherwise, it's ribat.rabata.org for our online academic program daybreak.rabata.org for our online bookstore and all of our publications are there as well as well as wow. our uh, new contest winners those are all at rabata.org you'll be able to see those and you can uh, your audience should go and check it out so they can see your award as yeah, the mashallah. winning cover best cover mashallah yeah, beautiful sure. cover I, I haven't read it I haven't read your book because um, I I because I didn't. I apologize, but I will <laughs> now. I'm looking. For, you gave it to me as a gift. I really yeah. appreciate that, and I'm looking forward to reading it. I'm, I'm a sure big my fan publisher, of Khadija, as we all are. <coughs> Mashallah, my my publisher, he he really put a lot of work into the uh, front cover, so credit really goes to him. And um, you know, I, I do hope that he. Uh, I'm going to be phoning him up afterwards, so He'll <laughs> be letting him know. And, and I want to say that even though that's true, and I'm a publisher, yeah. so I always appreciate those kudos, but. The cover comes from the story, the book. So your That's writing in, inspired that cover. So mm-hmm. congratulations to you too. Uh, and I hope that it's I hope this kind. reward is something that will help your book sell. And I hope that more and more <laughs> people will read it and will benefit from it and will get in libraries and schools around the world, inshallah. I hope so too. Jazakallah khairan. I really appreciate that. Um, Sheikh Tamara, um, I'm going to say salam to you now and uh, thank you for fitting us into your busy schedule. So, dear brothers and sisters, uh, alhamdulillah, we've, we've had a wonderful conversation with uh, Sheikha Tamara. And I hope you really, you know, enjoyed that. And I hope you're taking notes sometimes, you know. I know that podcasts are kind of seen as something to listen to. Uh, but, you know, mashallah, for me, when I listen to podcasts, if there's something amazing, something interesting, some gems, I always note them down and have my little book of inspiration. So I hope you're doing that too. Um, please do share this podcast episode with your family and friends. Help the Ilmfeed uh, YouTube channel to get to 100,000 subscribers. That's Mashallah. what we would love to do. Um, and 
remember that you can listen to us on all the different podcast platforms. So when you're going for a walk, when you're doing the dishes, I personally listen to <laughs> podcasts when I'm ironing, you know. Oh, perfect <laughs> timing. Love... Yeah. yeah, perfect time because you don't have all the, the noise of the water for, that you have with dishes, right? Exactly. Yeah. So d- do listen in and do share the episode with others. Um, inshallah, with that, I will leave you. Uh, Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.